So thank y'all for being here today to talk about Lewy body dementia specifically. You know, this dementia, there's a lot of similarities from Alzheimer's disease and maybe some vascular dementia similarities as well. Um, but we will talk specifically about the signs, the symptoms, and treatment options for Lewy body dementia. Before we get to that, the James L. West Center, we are a not for profit organization that serves people impacted by dementia. And we do that through a variety of um, services. One that you're taking advantage of today is our education programs. We provide a plethora of education to um, community members, family members, healthcare professionals, anybody that's just interested in learning more about dementia and um, how to best care for those living with the disease, but also how you care for yourself. We also have long-term care community here in Fort Worth. We do long-term care. We can do short-term respite stays that are overnight. We also have a day program that um, somebody can be a participant, just come during the day and get to go home at night. And then we are also offering short-term rehab that is specific to people with dementia. So if they come out of the hospital, maybe need to recover from a broken hip or anything, an infection, they come here, they do their rehab, and then they go home afterwards. Those are just some of the services we offer, um, and our expertise is dementia care. So we're glad that you are um, joining us today. I mentioned this already, but we're recording this program. I will send out a um, copy of the recording as soon as it's available after today. But I'll also send you a follow-up email um, this afternoon that will have a copy of the slides um, for today. But I'm also going to send you a link to an evaluation we ask that everybody complete the evaluation. Um, it's very short. It might take one to two minutes to complete it, but your feedback is incredibly invaluable to us. Um, but we're also offering one hour of CE credit for social workers, licensed professional counselors, nursing, and then if you want a certificate of, of attendance. Um, to receive those certificates, however, you must complete the evaluation. Um, that's for our reporting processes and um, audits. So. Again, I will send all this out this afternoon uh, with the instructions, but we do ask you complete the evaluation. So Lewy body dementia. Lewy body dementia really is a um, spectrum of symptoms that somebody has. Um, there's, they can have symptoms that are similar to people that have Alzheimer's disease or a vascular dementia, but there's also a lot of very different um, similar uh, symptoms that come along with Lewy body dementia. And it really covers that you can kind of think of Lewy body dementia as an umbrella term because you have dementia with Lewy bodies, but it also um, can have Parkinson's disease dementia that has Lewy bodies associated with it. We'll dive more into some, some of the complexities of this, um, but there is, you know, just think of it really with any dementia, but there's a spectrum of symptoms that somebody might present with Lewy body dementia with. Um, it also can have, um, be misdiagnosed um, at some point, you know, early on because of the symptoms that somebody may have. But of course, as this disease progresses, it is a progressive um, neurodegenerative dementia. And of course, the symptoms, that spectrum of symptoms is gonna change for the individual as well. Right now, Lewy body dementia is, they say it's the second most common type of dementia. I believe Lewy body and vascular dementia are tied for the second most common behind Alzheimer's disease dementia. It affects an estimated 1.4 million Americans. And like I mentioned, it can be misdiagnosed um, with another form of dementia or another psychiatric disorder. And, and as we dive more into it, you'll understand the why. The the time frame from somebody um, being diagnosed with dementia uh, or li living with dementia is typically five to eight years. Lewy body dementia, excuse me. It can range from anywhere from two years to 20 years, but typically it's five to eight years for most people that are diagnosed. It really does depend on that individual, whatever else they might be living with, their age, um, and some other factors that we'll discuss. But age does seem to be the greatest risk factor for developing Lewy body dementia. There's not a lot of understanding of why somebody gets Lewy body dementia and somebody doesn't. Um, there's a few things they've identified that can increase your risk. Of course, age is, um, is that number one risk factor for that. And they're looking at people over the age of 50 
um, or over the age of 60. And I know 50 is not old. 60 is not old either. Um, but really, as the older we get for any type of dementia, our risk increases. I will say that it is not a normal type, uh, part of aging, any type of dementia. Lewy body dementia, Alzheimer's dementia, they're not normal types or parts of aging, um, but they are becoming a more common diagnosis and Lewy body um, is up there. It, um, you know, with the um, slide before it had Parkinson's disease, dementia, and then Lewy body or dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, how you distinguish between those, we'll talk about the timing of the onset of certain symptoms. Because Lewy body dementia does typically get misdiagnosed as a Parkinson's disease, um, or a motor movement problem disorder because of some of the presentation of the symptoms. Um, but we'll talk about what distinguishes some of those diagnoses here at the end of the program. But dementia, it's a gradual progressive decline um, in somebody's cognitive skills, um, behavioral responses, their um, functioning throughout the day, how they're able to do their, their activities and skills throughout the day. Um, Lewy body dementia, or LBD that's listed there, um, in the early parts of their disease state, those early stages, maybe before they're diagnosed or we're starting to see some changes, they can, it's common for them to experience some physical changes um, that mimic Parkinson's disease, or they are developing those Parkinsonian movement disorders. So you might see somebody that has some mild tremors or um, their muscle movement has changed. They might be real rigid in their muscle movements, so they're stiff or they kind of move like in a, a cog wheel type, um, type way. You might notice that their gait is changing, their shuffling of their feet, they might be more stumped over. So the symptoms that we would see in somebody that has Parkinson's, we also can see it's very common in the early stages of somebody with a Lewy body dementia. You also might see some strong visual hallucinations early on in this disease state. And we're gonna discuss all of these a little bit more here in a few minutes. But Lewy bodies um, are a protein that becomes toxic and it develops on the outside of the, or the cortex, the outside of the brain. These proteins that become toxic start to attack the neurons in the brain. And as they start to attack those neurons, the neurons are not able to work properly. So the neuron cells die. And when we have those neuronal deaths, that's when we start to see the symptoms of somebody changing. But those symptoms are going to be dependent on where those cells are dying. So, for instance, with Lewy body dementia and that Parkinsonian movement disorders, we might see some of those cells dying in deep in the midbrain where some of those Lewy bodies are building up. So that's where those symptoms are coming up. Or if somebody's having some visual hallucinations, it's because that's part of the brain is where those cells have um, are being attacked or have died because of the Lewy body up in them. <clears throat> so we're seeing the changes. The symptoms of those changes are what we are seeing, whether it's a hallucination, a movement disorder, so forth, confusion, some other symptoms we'll talk about. Lewy bodies, these types of proteins are also found in people that have Alzheimer's disease, that have Parkinson's disease, um, some people with Down syndrome and other disorders. So there's still a lot of research to be done on why these Lewy bodies um, build up, what's happening, why some people get them and other people don't, et cetera. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this came straight from the Cleveland Clinic <clears throat> and I couldn't have explained it any better. So I just wrote it down here, but like I mentioned, we're really not sure why some people develop Lewy body dementia and others don't. And um, there is a combination of things that they think can be brought on to um, for somebody to develop Lewy body dementia. There's environmental risk factors. Just the natural part of aging can lead to the development of this, um, but also some mutations in somebody's genes. So one of the most common or excuse me, recent discoveries identified towards the cause of a Lewy body dementia um, is increasingly the number of a gene mutation. And they've discovered two genetic risk factors um, that are variants in genes that inc can increase your risk for Lewy body dementia. So the APOE gene, we um, already know and have identified that particular gene variant to be a um, risk factor in developing Alzheimer's disease. Now, let me back up for a second. I'm saying risk factor. 
I'm not saying deterministic. So just some of these, these variations of certain genes can increase your risk, but it does not mean it's a determination or that you definitely will get this um, type of dementia, whether it's Alzheimer's or Lewy body. It's just a risk factor that they've identified, okay? So the APOE risk um, or gene um, does increase your risk for having uh, Alzheimer's disease if you have a certain variant of that gene. They've identified the same is true for persons with Lewy body. But they've also identified the GBA gene that can increase your risk for both Parkinson's disease and Lewy body dementia. But please in bold there, despite these findings, genetic changes um, as a cause of Lewy body dementia are considered rare and they're not deterministic. Okay, um, most cases of Lewy body dementia aren't thought to be inherited, um, but we are starting to identify more mutations um, in genes that can increase your risk for that. A lot of research is going into this, um, and a lot of people are are finding new things every day. There's a I heard a doctor say one day, the more we learn about it, the more complex it is, um, which is you know we're learning more and more about. Lewy body dementia, Alzheimer's dementia, vascular dementia every day, but knowing that it just becomes more complex. And then also knowing that the treatment options for all of these are gonna be more um, wide reaching. I guess there's not gonna be one certain treatment for these dementias. It's gonna be a variety of different things um, that are gonna help treat, manage, maintain somebody's skills as we move forward, much like our treatment for cancer. As we're learning more about cancer and the development of it, the treatment options, there's a wide variety of treatment options that help with the treatment and management of cancer. And it's gonna be very individualistic as well. So Lewy body dementia, um, it's accumulation of this protein. It's an alpha-synuclein protein that they've called Lewy body. Um, Lewy bodies, again, are thought to be found initially in the cortex or this outer layer of our brain and deep in the midbrain or near the, the brain stem of our brain. Now, they're called Lewy bodies because they were identified by Frederick, Dr. Frederick Lewy in the early 1900s. Dr. Lewy and Dr. Alzheimer's were contemporaries of each other. So that's where the name comes from. But as these Lewy bodies, these proteins get built up in the brain and um, they change the chemicals you know, the, the wiring and the firing in between the neurons and in between the brain hemispheres. And they change the, um, how the neurons are able to work with each other. Um, so as those neurons are affected, again, they will eventually lead to the death of those cells and those neurons. Um, the Lewy bodies are found to mainly affect areas of involved in thinking, memory, and movement. And we know that they are related to people that are getting older, 60 plus, um, in Parkinson's disease, I mentioned, we do tend to see it more so slightly higher in males um, than we do women. Mm -hmm. And of course, the family history that we just mentioned a minute ago. Um, and this is a family history of somebody with Lewy bodies, but also a family history in somebody with um, Parkinson's disease. So this is what the Lewy bodies look like. So they really are a round protein that builds up on the cortex of the brain or inside the actual neuron. You can kind of see, it's kind of hard to read, but this would be a classic Lewy body. You can see how round it is right there in the brain tissue. The same over here on the upper left-hand corner. It's just a round, smooth protein buildup within the brain tissue. Uh, you can kind of see it's, you know, this little round kind of dot, circle um, inside the neuron. That, and as we have those foreign bodies essentially in our brains, tissue, our neurons, it's going to, our neurons are going to not be able to work properly. And here's another visual of Lewy body and how it starts and how it progresses. So the regions of the brain that are affected. And if we look at the left-hand side first, these are kind of those, um, the first stages of this disease. You have those brown um, or those round proteins built up, whether it's in the brain stem or the cortical area, the outer layer of our brain. And this is where we're gonna see some of those different symptoms start to present. If it's in the brain stem or deep in that midbrain, that's where, and you have some changes happening, that's where you're gonna see some um, autonomic changes. So our autonomic system, nervous system, are those involuntary things that happen. So it's our blood pressure, it's our heart rate, um, our, our sweating, you know, those things that we can't really control. So you might see some changes in that. Our movement, right? Then you might receive those tremors or gait changes. 
But then, of course, on the out, um, the cortex of the brain, this is where you're going to see some more of those other hallmark signs that we'll dive into. The first stage here, one thing that it points out is our olfactory area of our brain. So you might notice in somebody that they're having changes in their ability to smell or not to smell, or they're not recognizing smells, um, or they're smelling something that might not even be there. So you might see some changes in that particular sense because of that's where the, the changes that are happening in the brain. Mm -hmm. As the disease progresses and we have more buildup of the Lewy bodies, you can see um, it kind of breaks it out into stages three and four. And then we start to see more changes in our sleep disturbances and then more changes in our motor disturbances um, or motor movement symptoms, I should say or you're seeing some changes in the sleep. And then as it progresses more so, you can start to see the buildup more of the Lewy bodies in the brain stems and of course the cortical layer as well. And this is where we might see some um, symptoms of mood and behavioral changes, but also thinking changes, planning, making decisions, memory also. I'll point out, you know, I haven't really mentioned a lot so far in regards to symptoms about that short-term memory. While we may see some memory changes in somebody with dementia, um, we typically don't see those until a little bit later on in the disease state, as opposed to Alzheimer's disease, where those short-term memory um, challenges are is very present in the very early stages. That's one of those hallmark signs of Alzheimer's disease, that short-term memory loss. With Lewy body dementia, we will see memory changes, but again, it may not be until later on in that disease state, and we've already seen other symptoms, motor changes, sleep disturbances, um, confusion changes as well. So I just wanted to point that out because there's a difference between some of these hallmark signs that we see, and we don't want to, um, you know, kind of think, well, I don't really notice any memory issues, so it may not be that big of a deal, or they'll get over it, because these changes or symptoms that we're seeing, we do need to take note of them, and we need to be proactive about getting an accurate diagnosis. So with Lewy body, what typically happens um, when we see those, those symptoms are generally grouped um, into these five different categories, right? So we'll talk about some movement challenges, We'll talk about the cognitive symptoms that come up, cognitive changes. We'll talk about sleep challenges that come up, and then those um, autonomic nervous system changes that will happen, and of course, some mood and behavioral changes. Please note that this disease, any type of dementia, is very individualistic. Um, so what you see here, these are symptoms that we typically see present somebody that has a Lewy body dementia. Mm -hmm. um, you, yourself, your loved one, those that you're working with, um, you may notice some of these things and those, um, or you might notice, well, there's something that Jamie didn't really talk about that I'm seeing. Um, and this is, again, we need to talk and be um, in transparent communication and constant communication with those doctors, um, that diagnosing team, that um, interdisciplinary care team to talk about all the things, all the changes um, that you are seeing in your loved one or the person that you're working with. So breaking it up, we'll walk through each one of those categories and what these symptoms will look like. But cognitively, and I mentioned this a couple of times, that Lewy body can have changes, cognitive, change, cognitive changes similar to an Alzheimer's disease or a vascular dementia. So you very well can see some confusion. You can see a loss of poor judgment. Um, you'll see some mood and behavioral changes, which we'll talk about. You may see depression, and you may see some memory loss as well. Um, but what you typically will see is confusion. They may become disoriented to time and place. Where are they at in space? Um, some visuospatial changes, which we'll talk about. You may notice some challenges with their ability to use their words, to speak, use language to, commu to communicate um, or um, express themselves, but also comprehension as well. They might have a harder time comprehending what we're saying or instructions that we're giving. Um, changes in their ability to pay attention, to focus, to concentrate, trouble with wayfinding. So again, you may see some of these cognitive thinking challenges in somebody, and you may see some memory issues, but you may not see those memory issues until a little bit later in the disease progression. Approximately 80% of people with Lewy body dementia have a visual hallucination, and they have these early on. 
People with another type of dementia, particularly Alzheimer's disease, they may have visual hallucinations, but it's not until mid stages of that disease state or that dementia that they might have those visual hallucinations. But Lewy body, we typically see these early on. And the visual hallucinations can be well-defined, they can be detailed, um, they can be reoccurring. So they have the same hallucination over and over again. Um, but most of the time they're benign or they're not upsetting to, to the person. So it might be typically a lot of times it's um, like little kids or animals that they're seeing. You know, they're seeing this little group of bunnies hop around over here. I've talked to, to a gentleman that just kept seeing all these little bunnies over there in the corner. And he just thought it was fascinating. There were no bunnies in the corner, um, but he was seeing them and it was okay. It wasn't upsetting. He was actually pretty entertained by it. So I met him where he's at. and We talked about bunnies and rabbits. It was a great time. Um, I've also talked to a lady before where she was hearing kids. I mean, she would say those kids kept me up all night long. So this is not a visual hallucination, but um, it can be any hallucination where they're hearing something. Maybe they're tasting something that's not there. Or again, they're smelling something that may or may not be there. Um, but she was hearing kids and she would get a little bit irritated because they kept her up. Those damn kids kept me up all night last night. I cannot believe them. Dude, somebody got to take those kids home. I would meet her where she's at. Um, as opposed to saying, you know, ma'am, you didn't hear the kids. There are no kids here. You're just having hallucinations. It's part of your little body dementia. You're going to be okay. You know, we meet them where I'm at and say, oh my gosh, I hate that. I am so sorry you didn't get good sleep last night. I tell you what, I'm going to make sure those kids go home tonight so they don't bother you. Dude, I hear some, some coffee sounds good, don't you think? Let's go get some coffee so we can get some, uh, have some alertness here. And then you redirect from there. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, these hallucinations, no matter what it is, are really pretty um, um, not intrusive, right? Not upsetting. If they are upsetting, we'll talk about how to manage that because, of course, we want to meet those needs, too. So also some cognitive symptoms that we see that are fairly specific to a Lewy body dementia is their fluctuating of their um, either confusion or alertness. And it varies, um, ex I would say extremely, but also quickly. So they fluctuate. It could be from hour to hour. It could be from morning to night, from day to day, to where it's they're very alert at one point. Like, let's say in the morning, they're really alert in the morning. They're comprehending. Um, they're, be able, they're able to communicate back and forth, understand, alert. And then after lunch, that fluctuation, they're more confused. They're not able, maybe they might be unresponsive or they're not responding to questions that you're asking or directions that you're giving. Um, and their confusion is just much higher to where it's an extreme change for somebody. And again, this happens in a short amount of time. It can be from hour to hour, but I mean, you can see it from one day to the next, but it's those extreme fluctuations in a short amount of time. Again, it can be with alertness, um, it can be with um, attention, it can be with confusion that we see those. In another type of dementia, we can see them fluctuate, but the fluctuations aren't necessarily as an extreme and happen in a short amount of time. What you might see um, is somebody that starts to have sundowning or they become more confused or restless or agitated later in the day when they become more tired. And obviously you can have that in Lewy body dementia as well, but this fluctuating of this cognitive um, functioning is extreme and happens um, uh, again in that short amount of time. They can have a noticeable decline in their planning. This is planning out their day, planning out the activity that's in front of them, planning out what to do next problem solving, having a harder time with making decisions. Not that they can't make decisions, they're just having a much harder time with it. Again, changes in their ability to focus, pay attention, um, stay on task without um, support or without help or without cueing them back to it. Um, changes in memory. And then of course, less understanding of visual information. So this is different than a visual hallucination because a hallucination is seeing, hearing, smelling something that's not there. Um, misunderstanding visual information is kind of a misinterpreting, misinterpreting what they're seeing. 
Um, it can be because they have a decreased depth perception. So the world may um, not appear as 3D to them as it might to you and I. So it might be that they're looking at um, kind of flat paper. Like if you've ever looked at a map, um, you can look at it 3D, but they're also looking at it 2D. It's a little bit harder to figure out, so it can be hard for them. Um, they can have a harder time recognizing objects, and this is early in their disease state. So it's not that they don't see an object in front of them, um, like the phone. They may just not recognize that object or fully understand how to use it. Excuse me, And that can change from, again, moment to moment, depending on where cognitive, cognitive um, they're functioning in that moment. And their hand-eye coordination um, can be noticeably declined as well. Um, so it can, you know, their changes in their gait is one thing, but that hand-eye coordination, so you will notice this more with those fine motor skills. Um, you might notice it at the table, you know, as they're eating their meal um, and bringing up their spoon to their mouth. They may miss their mouth. Um, they may, um, uh, like, uh, move the spoon or the fork early because they thought they were already out their mouth. They may go to grab the drink and they've missed the drink completely. So that hand-eye coordination, but also understanding where they are in space and time. So where am I relative to what I'm grabbing? And so um, being able to understand that space and the distance from where I'm reaching and grabbing. You can notice some change um, or noticeable changes happen in those those cognitive parts of the brain that are being damaged. So sleep problems are also something that we see that are pretty hallmark to Lewy body dementia. And a lot of times what this looks like, um, and, I, and I'll kind of um, pop ahead a little bit, but this last bullet point here, it says that symptoms may, um, symptoms of sleep problems you may see years before um, a diagnosis of Lewy body dementia. So a sleep disturbance or a sleep issue, you might be one of the first symptoms that we see and you noticed it years before we start to see any other symptoms. But what this can look like is you can notice there's just changes in their sleep patterns. All right, they're not sleeping as much at night. They're sleeping more during the day, you know, by vice versa. It can be a lot. They can be napping more. They might have excessive daytime sleepiness or they might have insomnia. So you're going to see some changes. You can see some changes in that in those regards. But with the Lewy bodies, um, a common thing that we see are these um, sleep disorders. And it's rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder. And what this is, this particular condition um, really is they start to act out their dreams. So they're going to be moving a lot more when they're asleep. It might be they're jerking, um, they're flailing their arms, they're um, kicking their legs. They might be verbally acting out as well. So they might be talking, they might be yelling. Um, you just notice that they're very active when they're sleeping, okay? Um, another hallmark change for this or part of this sleep disorder is they can have a hard time separating or understanding that what they dreamt was just a dream as opposed to what's happened in reality. So they have a hard time separating. So if they had a nightmare or they dreamt something, they may really think that's happened and not, and they can't separate that that was something they dreamt. So this um, movement disorders or um, the autonomic nervous system changes that happen. Um, we see these movement disorders occur in about 70% of persons that have Lewy body dementia. About 30% of these um, persons with Lewy body dementia, they're commonly those that are older. Um, these symptoms occur first before they develop dementia symptoms. So this is where it gets complex, right? I just said sleep disturbance issues you might see years before you see any other symptoms. That's pretty common. But this is also saying for those that are um, particularly older, you might see some movement disorders. Um, first, before you start to see any cognitive changes. So before you start to see, um, you know, the planning of stuff, the confusion, or even even sleep problems as well. Um, some people may first show um, the motor movement problems or the Parkinsonian movement disorder. They might see those first. And this can look like a, um, they don't have spontaneous movement anymore. They're rigid. They're very slow in their movements, loss of balance. Etc. So you might see these first. But other things that what 
that are symptoms of Lewy body dementia. Um, of course, balance problems, shuffling of their feet, loss of coordination, and this is eye-hand coordination, but it's just loss of coordination overall, slowed movements, um, and this is called bradykinesia, and um, I mean, it's just, they are moving very, very slow, and that's the only pace they can go. Okay. You might notice a lot more falls that are happening, or even that they're running into things that they shouldn't, like they're running into furniture that they shouldn't be, you know, they should have avoided that furniture. You can see changes in their body temperature, blood pressure fluctuations. They might get um, more dizzy, you know, and it can be dizzy from when they're standing up or moving, transitioning from one spot to the next. But it also may just be that they're standing or sitting there and they become dizzy. You might see some fainting with them. Um, very sensitive to hot or cold. You can see some reduced facial expression, so it's called a flat effect. To, and this has to do with the movements, um, excuse me, the muscles in the face, that they're not able to move the muscles in, those, in the face, so they're not able to smile or have facial expressions to anything. It's not that they're not, they don't have expressions or responses, but they're just not able to move the muscles in their face. You might notice that they have smaller handwriting than they normally would have had. You can notice some tremors. You might notice um, decline or changes or not able to have a sexual function. And then changes in um, urinary system problems. It might be that they're constipated, but it might also see you're seeing some incontinence or accidents early, whether it's urine or fecal or both. Having a hard time swallowing. Um, and then other problems. And this can be altered heart rate. They might have excessive sweating. Um, they might have it at exercise intolerance. So even getting up from their chair and walking to the kitchen table can really wear them out. Uh, they're breathing heavy. It's just that intolerance for any type of movement. Mm -hmm. Now, these are just some examples of symptoms that we might see. And then that last category of mood and behavioral symptoms. So behavioral problems, um, or I should say behavioral expressions, excuse me, um, are common with any type of dementia. Um, but with fluid body dementia, you can see it as well. You might notice early on that they're ver verbally um, or even physically become more aggressive. They can become very um, combative or uncooperative, particularly during ADL time where we're helping them with those activity activities of daily living, whether it's helping them get dressed, helping them with their meals in the bathroom or in the shower. Um, along with those hallucinations I mentioned, they can also have delusion about something um, or paranoia. So they are paranoid. Or um, any type of sleep issue that they may have absolutely can affect their mood during the day and their ability to uh, respond and react to things, right? Um, unresponsiveness, and this can be because of if they're having a fluctuation in their cognitive, you know, those cognitive fluctuations that are happening, um, but it might just also be unresponsive because there might be some depression there. There might be apathy there as well. They can easily get agitated, um, restless or aggressive, and then um, have higher anxiety too. So we have all these symptoms, and that is a lot of symptoms that I just covered for one particular dementia. Um, but I mentioned this is a complex, so we'll talk about how they diagnose this specifically, but it's complex. Um, but I want to point out that there's the symptoms that come with this. A lot of those symptoms I mentioned are similar to Alzheimer's disease or a vascular dementia, but there are also some symptoms that are very unique to a Lewy body dementia. Um, the ones that stand out the most are the, the fluctuation of their cognition or their confusion in a short amount of time, um, the Parkinsonian movement disorders, the sleep challenges, and um, visual hallucinations. Those ones that present early, those are very um, specific to a Lewy body dementia. So Parkinson's disease versus Lewy body dementia, because there's Lewy body and then there's Parkinson's de disease dementia. Um, dementia with Lewy body or Lewy body dementia, what happens is Generally, we see cognitive deficits appear within the same year as those Parkinsonian movement disorders. So somebody that has um, Lewy body dementia, 
their symptoms will, will present within the same year that they'll have cognitive challenges, changes in the brain, but also the movement Parkinsonian challenges that they have. That'll, those will all present within one year of each other. Somebody that has Parkinson's with dementia, those cognitive deficits or the cognitive challenges will appear beyond one year of those Parkinsonian movement disorders. So somebody with Parkinson's disease with dementia, you're gonna notice the Parkinsonian, you're gonna notice the tremors, the gait changes, um, the hunching over, those movement disorders, and you'll have those for a year or more, then we'll start to see symptoms of cognitive changes that have that happen. And most of the time that would be diagnosed as a Parkinson's disease dementia. Of course, symptoms can be similar. Um, and we know that people that have just straight Parkinson's disease, they will also, um, can also have Lewy bodies or Lewy bodies will eventually present inside their brain as that particular disease um, progresses. People that have just Parkinson's disease, as their Parkinson's disease progresses, they're at a much higher risk to also develop dementia. And a lot of the times it is a Lewy body dementia or an Alzheimer's dementia. Um, but these symptoms can overlap, of course. Um, and so somebody can have a mixed diagnosis or there's a dual diagnosis of both diseases. Um, with the diagnosing, we'll talk about what the criteria looks like. Um, it can be complex. Uh, but we know that the treatments for this and how we manage and care for somebody that's living with any of these dementias are going to be roughly the same. So healthcare providers um, are, use the steps here listed on the screen to help them um, diagnose the Lewy body dementia. And, and a lot of it can be ruling out. I want to rule out um, some similar condition that might be causing this. So all the time they will get a de detailed medical history and do a physical exam. Um, they're going to ask um, all of your medical history, do an in-depth physical exam, physical, but they'll also do a cognitive exam, memory, emotional, behavioral, uh, you know, movement. They're going to do all these exams. They're going to ask for all your medications and uh, medications that are prescribed by all the doctors that have prescribed medications and those medications that you prescribed yourself. So those over-the-counter medications as well. We want to make sure that we rule every possible thing out. And then they can ask for a family medical history as well to see if anything, what potential condition might be um, in the family. Um, imaging can be done with the imaging and with this particular disease, they use those imagings to rule out other possibilities. Um, so they want to make sure and rule out it's bleeding on the brain or rule out a tumor. And then they'll do extensive neurological exam testing. Um, so they're going to do memory testing, attention, word finding, visual, spatial skills, um, a big blood test, and then some sleep studies as well as needed and as appropriate or as indicated. So with um, diagnosing Lewy bodies, um, what they look at or what a clinician, diagnostic clinician is going to look at is what must be present for it to be a Lewy body dementia is uh, the progressive cognitive decline that interferes with normal activities, right? That is um, what dementia is typically described as. But then there need to be two of the following that are also present. So that can be the fluctuating of the cognition or that the, their mental status, alertness, or confusion, visual hallucinations, and Parkinsonian movement. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at those really hallmark symptoms that we've identified to, to diagnose a Lewy body dementia. The Lewy body is also likely, more likely to be diagnosed if there are more falls, if they have delusions, if they're fainting, um, if they're sensitive to any neuroleptic uh, medications given to control hallucinations or psychiatric symptoms. So one thing, um, another thing with Lewy body dementia is if we give medications to help with those visual um, hallucinations, if they're upsetting, um, people with Lewy body dementia can be overly sensitive to those antipsychotic medications that help with those symptoms. So we want to be very careful um, when prescribing any type of antipsychotic, um, but also particularly if we are thinking that it might be a Lewy body dementia because they are um, especially sensitive to those. So again, the timing of the symptoms, if both the cognitive and the motor movement um, symptoms appear within one year of each other, more than likely, Lewy body dementia is the cause. 
if the motor uh, movement symptoms appear first, and then the cognitive symptoms don't appear until um, one or more years later, it indicates more of a Parkinson's disease dementia. And then signs of stroke um, or vascular dementia, they usually rule out Lewy body dementia. This chart, I know it might be hard to see, but it, it helps um, kind of distinguish what those characteristics are between Lewy body dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and this Parkinson's disease dementia. Um, I will, you'll have the copy of this um, after I so you can look more at it later. Um, but that's just a nice um, kind of categorizing, categorizing it all out um, in a simple way. Because I do want to make sure we get to some treatments um, and how do we care for those living with this disease and how do we care for ourselves. That diet and exercise are of utmost importance, really just as we're getting older with any type of dementia we may be living with, um, but particularly Lewy body dementia um, or a Parkinson's disease dementia as well, uh, making sure that the food that they're the nutrition that we're getting, that they're getting is going to help them thrive. You know, using food as medicine is very important, but also when it comes to nutrition and diet, I'm um, cutting out what's not serving us well. You know, there are a lot of foods and drinks out there that can exacerbate symptoms or can cause other problems. And we want to make sure and eliminate those from our diets and um, add stuff that's really going to help us have energy, help us feel better, help us thrive. And then exercise is very important. Exercise can help stave off um, or maintain some of those Parkinsonian movement um, um, issues for a long period of time, right? It can also help with the cognition with any type of dementia because it's the, the exercise is so beneficial. It's getting blood flow up to the brain. Um, we're having to use most of our brain when we're exercising because we got to use the, obviously the muscles that control our brain or the brain that controls the muscle part of our um, bo uh, bodies. We have to think things through. We have to time stuff out. We have to be able to concentrate. And if we're doing with a group setting, that's even better because then we're socializing within that group that we're exercising with. Um, so diet not only is just actually exercise not only just great for our physical improvement, but also our cognitive. Medication, uh, let me say, um, also working with the, uh, physical therapy, speech therapy, and occupational therapy. And then, of course, music and art therapy as well. Um, to help with the exercise, to help with the movements, to help with the cognition, um, but just also that social and mental and emotional well-being too. Medications, there are medications that can help. Some medications that we use to help treat Alzheimer's disease can be beneficial for Lewy body dementia. And they might also help um, ease the symptoms of depression, ease the symptoms of um, anxiety, potentially lessen hallucinations. Um, and using antidepressants with any medications, whether it's um, uh, an Alzheimer's disease FDA approved drug or it's an anti-Parkinson's drug because you can use those to help with the movement disorders. Or it might be um, a medication that is helping with hallucinations if it's needed. Any of these medications, we absolutely want to be uh, very aware of what the side effects are. Watch the changes that we see. Um, and our loved ones take note of them and stay in constant communication with the doctor and then and even the pharmacist as well. So we can identify, is this working? Is it getting better? Do we need to um, up the dosage a little bit? Do we need to take that dosage back down? Do we need to try a different medication? Because this is what I'm seeing. And I encourage you to write it down. Keep a medication side effect journal um, with any medication or any change that you have in a medication. And that goes for those you're caring for, but that also goes for yourself. Managing any sleep disorders that they have. So if you do need to do a sleep study, um, get them on, maybe they have sleep apnea, maybe they need to get on a CPAP, maybe there's some other medications that can help manage sleep disorders. Again, we wanna manage, watch the side effects and watch how it's affecting that individual. Um, the medication list up here, um, Lanazepam, I think I'm saying that right, um, or melatonin, please know that I am not a doctor. I am not at prescribing these medications. These are things that are typically prescribed for this dementia, and you really want to talk to a doctor about it. Um, it even says right there, be aware of the side effects. You want to start very low and go slow from there. 
or you might not do it at all. It's a, it's a conversation between you and your doctor and being an advocate um, for those that you're caring for. Melatonin is the same way. Melatonin is an over-the-counter hormone. Um, please talk to your doctor before starting to incorporate that into any type of regimen, whether it's for those you care for or yourself. Um, and talk to the pharmacist as well, because um, it can interfere with other medications that you're prescribed, and you want to be aware of how it can affect some of the side effects. Avoid taking long naps during the day. Um, naps are okay, but we don't want them sleeping all day long and then not being able to sleep at night. So it's really just maintaining a really nice sleep hygiene. Um, and, you know, there's ways to do that. We're getting up around the same time. We're going to bed around the same time. We make sure that we incorporate plenty of exercise during the day. So we tire out the body. We tire out the brain. And then we watch what we are intaking as well. So this is where that nutrition and diet comes in. Avoid alcohol. Avoid caffeine late in the day. Avoid any food that might be upsetting, whether it's um, going to cause heartburn or they're prone to constipation, or they're lactose intolerant, let's just be really aware because that can absolutely affect our sleep um, and affect our mood as well. Um, for the mood and behavioral problems, um, for anything, a non-pharmacological intervention is always the best option. You always want to try this option first, no matter what type of dementia you're living with. Um, this isn't might be an environmental change. You might use light therapy, reminiscence therapy. You're doing pet therapy, music therapy, speech, occupational, physical, um, all of those therapies, of course. We want to make sure that there's a routine. Routine, routine, routine is important. And with a routine, um, we there's a familiarity, there's a comfort level throughout the day. There's a safety and security feeling that comes along with that. Um, we might want to look at any medication review um, in this, like I mentioned, the, if for a diagnosing doctor, they'll look for it, but just as medications change throughout the course of a disease process, or as we get older, um, a frequent medication review is important um, because, again, you might be prescribed something that interferes with something else, or you started to take in that over-counter allergy medication because the weather's changing, and that might be interfering with something and causing some side effects, or not allowing that prescription medication to work to its best ability. And then antipsychotics. Um, I talked about those. If you are prescribed those, um, you again, be very cautious, start at the lowest dose. And the antipsychotics are not meant to be a long-term use medication. They're meant to help for a short period of time to ease the symptom that it needs, that needs to be uh, managed. So it's, um, it's knowing that, going on for a short period of time, and then slowly coming off with the direction and instruction of the doctor and seeing how they do from there. If somebody is having a hallucination that's not benign, that's not okay, that they're really upset about something or there's a delusion that they have or they're high paranoia, we always wanna to try to keep them as calm as possible. Um, we don't wanna try and reason with them, be rational with them, tell them that they're wrong, what they're hearing or seeing or what they're believing is not true um, because to them in their world, it's very real. It's very true to them. And for us to come in and say it's not um, can make it a lot worse. And it can um, really interfere or damage that relationship and trust between you and that person. So we want to meet them where they're at. We want to support them. We want to validate their feelings, whether they're scared of something, um, they're upset about something. We want to validate that. I validate that you are having a hard time. I, you know, I understand that this is hard. I understand that you're scared. I am, you know, I would be scared as well. Um, we do want to make note of what they're saying and what they're doing. So we can talk to our doctor about this at a later date, but in the moment, we want to meet them where they're at and connect with them. And then I would say redirect from there, make that connection, validate that feeling, but let's change the environment, particularly if it's a hallucination of some sort. Changing the environment is huge. And this can be anywhere from just let's go to a different room. Let's take a ride around the block. Let's close the blinds. Let's turn off that TV. You name it. Um, a change in the environment can help them kind of reset where they're at. Um, that, and, and then we can go from there. This is upsetting. You know, let's I validate the feeling. But let's redirect into something else. But we have to make that connection first. And then we want to talk to a doctor about it later and say, this is 
Maybe it was a one-time thing, but it might be a reoccurring expression that they're having, and we want to talk to a doctor about it, um, because it's not something that they're doing to give us a hard time. They're having a hard time, and it might have something to do with the damage that's happening to certain areas of the brain. They don't have any control over it. They really are doing the best they can from moment to moment. Looking at palliative care um, for all of this, and palliative care is we are really treating the symptoms of the care. We're going to do treatments, of course, throughout the course of the disease, but it's really a focus on treating the symptoms. So we are treating the, um, if they have anxiety, high anxiety, we're treating depression, we're treating, you know, the Parkinsonian movement disorders as we can and as it's appropriate. Um, limit sensory stimulation um, and use distractions. So it's being aware of how are they interpreting their world? Is the lighting too much? Is the TV show that's on too difficult to understand? Um, or is it their misunderstanding of what's happening on the TV? Is that really happening in reality? Maybe we need to look look at what we're watching. Um, uh, too many people in the room. What's the temperature in the room? If they're overly sensitive to hot or cold, let's be aware of that um, and, and adjust as we need to. Uh, sleep schedule is important. I talked about that sleep hygiene to help them. It's not going to, you know, 100% fix anything if their sleep pattern is off or, or anything, but it can help kind of maintain a little bit. And we are able to kind of reset our circadian rhythms. It may take a while. If we stick to that routine, eventually you'll notice the body can kind of reset itself. But we got to stick to a routine throughout the day, but that sleep routine as well. And it might take 90 days but it's important for us to do that. Get on a toileting schedule. You know, every two hours we are um, going to the restroom. So we don't have, um, particularly with those auto, um, autonomic changes that are happening, if they have a dysfunction in the urinary or fecal area um, that we're getting them to the restroom. So some of those accidents may not have to happen, um, but we can get them cleaned up easier. And then prioritizing self-care as a caregiver. You know, it's right here. Remind ourselves that our expressions the behavioral expressions of this disease um, are a part of this disease and they are not giving us a hard time. They're having a hard time. So we wanna frequently assess and monitor um, knowing that this disease is progressive, it's gonna change over time. So we need to make sure that we're monitoring and assessing medications, their changes, their abilities, but also monitor and assess um, our abilities and the changes that are happening with us as well. We want to be also, um, as caregivers, we also want to learn the best ways to help them physically. So this might be if you're working with the physical therapist or anything, what are, we need to learn the exercises on how to help transfer, how to help them get up out of the chair and sit back down in the chair. So I don't throw my back out or I don't, or my knee or whatever the shoulder or whatever it is. So I am, I am properly doing body mechanics to help them physically to maintain their independence and dignity for as long as possible, but I need to learn how to best do that. Um, and of course, be skilled in the direction, of, in the redirection of hallucinations or confusion um, and validating their emotions. And there's plenty of resources that you can access, whether it's through support groups, um, uh, and continuing to come to our programs on stress management and other, um, you know, communication skills and how to manage physical and emotional behaviors with dementia. Um, but there's also Blue Body Dementia Association. Um, they have specific support groups. They have education on their website. Um, of course, research, there's the, um, the Michael J. Fox Parkinson Foundation has a lot of great education on that as well. You know, it's very specific to Parkinson's disease, but it's also very applicable to um, uh, working with somebody with Blue Body Dementia. And this is just a quick thing about um, Blue Body Dementia and anesthesia. <clears throat> Uh, this is, I think really this is applicable for anybody with dementia, um, but I have this on there just for your additional information. I want to make sure that we leave time for any questions that you all have, um, but I also want us to watch this quick video. Richard Zeller is here. He has Lewy body dementia, um, just to hear from somebody. It happened little by little. First, he would forget things, and then he'd lose track of what he was doing. Lewy body dementia took over the life of the man you're about to meet. The disease is the second most common form of dementia, Alzheimer's being the first. There is no cure, but experts at Mayo Clinic are researching Lewy body disease in hopes of improving the lives of people who struggle with it. In, in hindsight, though, there were things going on before, but you think, you know, 
I'm thinking he's 75, I'll be there one day. It's just part of the aging. But the little changes Marjorie Zellers noticed in her husband Richard were early signs of Lewy body dementia. Expressions were almost not there anymore. Richard also developed Parkinsonism, which often oh, accompanies a diagnosis of Lewy body dementia. And the stiffness in walking, his Every gait time. changed tremendously. Their lives have also changed tremendously. Because he was a boater, tennis player, racquetball player. Richard is not independent anymore. His symptoms are slowly getting worse. Six months ago, I just kept thinking it's gonna go back. I kept wanting it to be like it was but it's taken a long time to realize that it's not. In a moment of clarity, Richard describes what it's like to slowly lose function. It's like some, you, we wrote all your information on a blackboard and just come in with an eraser and just zap through it. And what's left is the problem. And the other one's gone and then going to come back. You can try and improve on it. And improving on it is what Dr. Tannis Furman and Dr. Dennis Dixon strive to do. We try very hard to detect and diagnose as early as possible because our goal is to try to reduce patient suffering, improve their quality of life. And if we can increase the person's level of functioning to a higher level early on, that's a, a, an appropriate goal for us. Dr. Furman says it's key to make sure the diagnosis is correct. You see, Lewy body disease is often misdiagnosed as Alzheimer's disease, and the two may respond differently to some medications. And because there is no cure, the disease will inevitably progress. Dr. Dixon is researching what Lewy body disease does to the brain. So the idea is to find molecular underpinnings of the disorders that can be used for, for biomarkers to b diagnose it accurately. And also, if we study the, the uh, molecular and pathologic underpinnings of the disorder, those might lead to um, avenues for treatment. The hope of new treatments to improve the lives of people like Richard Zellers. In addition to making sure the diagnosis is accurate so people can get on proper medications, Dr. Furman says it's also important to help patients and their caregivers get the support they need at home. That can ensure a better quality of life for patients and their loved ones. For Medical Edge, I'm Vivian Williams. So I hope you found that helpful. Here's another list of resources for more information. Um, the Lewy Body Association, I mentioned the Cleveland Clinic, um, the Parkinson's Foundation, Michael J. Fox Foundation, they all have a plethora of education resources, um, access to support groups. We also have support groups here at the West Center. If you are uh, interested, we have one that meets at one o'clock on Wednesdays here. Um, this is our information, and I want to make sure and open it up if anybody has any questions or anything they want to share. You can either unmute or put it in the chat. Hey, Jamie. I yeah. wanted to ask you a question. Um, so I have a client who does have disturbing visual um, visual airplanes are dropping airplanes are dropping things from the sky so um he's very distressed and he is also sensitive to the medication mm -hmm. um, and so do you what other options do you know other options other than just being calm he gets very very rigid stiff he doesn't want to be moved out of that location of um, yeah. resistant so um just looking for other things. Yeah, um, you know, I'd say, what is his past? Um, you know, I, if he doesn't want to move out of that location and he's distressed about something, what can we bring to him? Um, whether it's music or it might be a, a pet or just a reassuring person that he trusts to be there with him, validate him, meet him where he's at, talk about it, um, and then maybe slowly redirect them, bring them some food, something like that. Uh, but mm -hmm. it might just be, we need to be with him as the, he's having a distressing moment. Um, talking to the doctor about what type of medications could we possibly try? Um, and then maybe identifying, is there a certain time of day this is happening? Is it, uh, uh, are there any themes of when or why or where this reoccurring hallucination is happening? Again, it might just be part of the disease. And knowing that we got to put some stuff in place to help um, ease the comfort of it until this passes. Mm -hmm. You know, hope that helps. 
Um, if anybody else has a suggestion, please um, add on. But. Jamie, this is Holly. Um, my mom has had Parkinson's with dementia for 16 years now. Um, when we get her up in the morning, she's extremely um, uh, tight and rigid and stiff. Um, and I found that what helps her most is I get her up, you know, help her sit on the edge of the bed and then um, give her her medication and get her to the bathroom. And then dad has installed lots of grab bars in the bathroom and that just that warm water of a shower. You know, I help her, but just let her stand in the water for 15, 20 minutes and bathe her during, of course, but um, just that warm water makes her feel so much better. And then I lotion her up really good afterwards and she likes that massage also. And once we're dressed and everything, then she feels so much better and she eats her breakfast when we get on with our day. Awesome, thank you, Holly, thanks for sharing that, yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and as you were saying that, I thought, oh, a warm, like a nice, really warm blanket may help just kind of loosen you up a little bit, potentially, right? Um, yeah, so it just kind of loosens those joints yeah. to make it easier for them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Cassie chatted something in about using anesthesia. Um, and the doctor said it was normal after surgery, but... We didn't agree so much. It is with any type of dementia, the anesthesia, the type and how long you're under is a factor, something you want to talk to your doctor about it. Because um, there is such a thing as, you know, anesthesia brain, right? But when there's already some changes happening because of dementia, there's you're a little bit higher risk um, for permanent changes to happen. So, well, I appreciate you all. Um, again, I'm going to send out the copy of the slides. I'll send a copy of the recording as soon as it's available in that evaluation, but please um, don't hesitate to reach out with any questions and we will see y'all next time. Thank y'all very much.